Good morning, everybody. Can you all take your seats so we can get started? Well, good morning again. My name is Lori Leshen, and I'm the president of the Planetary Sciences section of AGU. I'd like to welcome you all to this morning's Shoemaker Lecture. We're very excited to have Carly Peters with us. But before we uh, dive into the Shoemaker lectures, uh, Lecture, I'd like to just do, take care of one piece of, of business, um, which is to say an official thank you to my predecessor in this job, Bruce Joukowsky, who is the now immediate past president of the Planetary Sciences section. Um, Bruce is here in the audience. I just uh, would like to say a quick word. For those of you that are not heavily involved in, in AGU, you may not be aware that, that this past two years during the term that Bruce was president of our section were probably the most, some of the most dramatic changes in the history of AGU. Um, the organization has gone through significant changes. The union is in the process of, of thinking through changes in how it's organized, and, and we've changed our governance model. And those discussions have been intense at times, have been um, very interesting and important because the future of our science, this is the largest organization that represents our science, so, so it's a very important time to have been involved. And Bruce was always a very deliberative member of the leadership of the union and made sure that our voice as a planetary science community was always present and always heard. So can you please join me in thanking Bruce for his service to AGU these last two years? And Bruce, if you'd come up here. We have a lovely plaque or framed certificate or something. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I say anything? Wow, they even spelled my name right. <laughs> uh, they, they say that this is a thankless task. Clearly, uh, that's not true. I really appreciate the uh, thanks that I'm getting, and it's been a pleasure and an honor uh, working to serve the section. And Lori, good luck. All right, thanks, Bruce. Okay, and now on to our uh, wonderful task this morning, which is the Shoemaker Lecture. Um, I'll say something about Carly here in a moment, but first I wanna, I wanna remind us all about the person that this lecture is named for, Jean Shoemaker, who is probably well known to many of us who have been around for a little while, but may not be that well known to some of our, of our younger members. And of course, AGU members are 20% students. So in fact, we've got a great um, upcoming discipline um, with us here, hopefully here in the room with us. So, so Jean, of course, is, is essentially the father of our discipline, modern planetary science, as separate from astronomy. He was also the founder of the astrogeology branch of the U.S. Geological Survey. He was a Caltech professor. Unfortunately, I just missed him as a graduate student at Caltech. He had just retired when I, when I got there. He was the recipient of the National Medal of Science, which is the highest scientific honor our nation bestows, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and, of course, also a recipient of the Whipple Award of AGU, very importantly. Um, Gene was well known for his game-changing work on impacts on Earth, impactors in space, but one of his true passions and, and earliest passions in planetary science was his love of the moon. He was one of the first people who really envisioned doing geology in space with humans and with robotic scouts. Um, he dreamed himself of being the first geologist in space, but unfortunately uh, a health condition that prevented that from happening. But in fact, that dream came true in that he was one of the key trainers of the Apollo astronauts and in fact, participated in, and was a leader in the science on, on missions ranging from Ranger all the way through Clementine. So in fact, he was uh, one of our premier space geologists and lunar geologists. Um, given his love of all things lunar, I'm sure he would uh, revel in the extraordinary renaissance in lunar science over the past few years and that he would be especially pleased that we've asked Carly to be our speaker uh, here today to discuss the very latest results from new spacecraft observations. Carly Peters is a professor of geological sciences at Brown University, a pioneer in lunar science and remote sensing. She's been a leader in making spectroscopic characterizations of planetary surfaces, especially the moon. 
Um, this spectroscopic characterization, of course, has become an absolutely indispensable tool for the characterization of, of planetary objects. Uh, she got her PhD at MIT in the late 70s. I can only imagine how friendly an environment for women that was. <clears throat> but we won't talk about that. Um, she's been a pioneer throughout her career, in fact. Think about it, how many women instrument PIs do we know in our field? So Par Carly is truly a, an amazing pioneer. Um, she has been the PI of the uh, Moon Mineralogy Mapper instrument, the M-cubed instrument. And I think she'll show us, I hope, some cool results from that today, a little bit, maybe. Talk some about that. Um, she's been honored uh, for her contributions to our field, including just very recently, this past couple of months, the Gilbert Award of the GSA. She's a past recipient of the DPS's Kuiper Prize, and she's a fellow of AGU. She brings technical know-how to her endeavors, but, but it's fair to say, I think, that her passion is the science. So I think she'll take us on a great science journey today. A, a few years ago, most of us probably would never have anticipated we'd be talking about the, the cold, dead moon as dynamic, active, and even wet. So she's here to give us the latest results. If she shows some spectroscopy, I'm hoping she'll compare the spectra of the moon to spectra of chocolate, which I understand she actually has. One, something you may not know about Carly is she's a serious chocoholic, and one reason I'm sure she's a fan of the, the basaltic portions of the moon rather than the lunar crust is that she likes the dark chocolate instead of the white chocolate, but you know, we will we'll let her tell us her theories on the moon and chocolate um, as part of her discussion with us today. Uh, as she talks about the moon as a template for the terrestrial planets, please join me in welcoming Carly Peters, this year's Shoemaker Lecture. And we have a, uh, a certificate for her uh, as thanks for her giving our lecture today. So I will give that to you maybe at the end. I will hold that for you. Um, but thank you, and we're looking forward to, uh, to your lecture. Oops, we have to make oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lori. This is an exceptional honor to be here. Uh, and and uh, I have, I can't tell you how how pleased I am to be giving the Shoemaker Lecture itself. Um, uh, many of you will probably recognize this beautiful image that I have here, which is a thin section of one of the Pharaoh and Anorthosites, and I'll give you a little bit more details about that in a moment. But first, I'd like to return to uh, Jean Shoemaker, um, and, and for those of you who, who um, don't haven't had the pleasure of knowing him, I thought I'd give you a little more background. Laurie's given you a good introduction, and here's a little bit more about some of the things he did. There once was a shoemaker named Jean. He's an astrogeologist, I mean. Sooner or later, he thought meteor crater was formed by an explosion, it seemed. Whether volcanic or impact could not be resolved until this astrogeology mystery was solved. Mars, Gene rejected. For rocks were ejected that showed huge energetic forces were involved. Now, what could have made that hole in the ground? The shape is almost but not quite round. Gene said, when a bolide just happens to collide, Inevitably, a crater is formed. He mapped the crater from rim to rim, over and under and in, and up and in. He studied the rocks. He learned that the shock termed form cosite, where quartz crystals had been. Gene knew impact craters covered moon's face. He soon found craters all over the place on Mercury, on Venus, on Phobos, and Deimos. Not a thing was untouched in any case. Throughout deep space, there is ample debris. And all impactors are also impactees. An asteroid or comet, and rock and dust on it, all strike with great velocity. With all things that go bump in the night, they've recognized worlds and moon alike 
They shatter and scatter and vaporize matter. It's amazing there's things still left that's right. It was not possible for Gene to retire. He kept working and prob uh, probed until he expired. Simply no end to colleagues and friends are here for all that he deeply inspired. Uh, and the job's not done, it's still fun. So let's move on. Um, this rock is, as I mentioned, a, an anorthosite from Apollo 16. It's very old, um, four and a half, uh, 4.4 giga years, and we'll come back to that several times in this discussion. It is anorthositic, uh, uh, highly uh, calcium rich, uh, and it's presumed to for, be uh, one of the cumulates from the magma ocean. These are the topics that I'm going to be touching on today. Um, and I'll go through these rather quickly. We don't have as much time as I would like, of course. Uh, but I'll concentrate on the first billion years and, and in the later part give several examples uh, that are lunar related to the key of understanding terrestrial problems. But first, we need to sort of see where we are and how did we get where we are and why is it important. So go back to the beginning, but not quite the beginning because as you know, stars had to form heavy elements, and it took billions and billions and billions and billions of years to do that. And it's only the last, say, five billion, six billion years that there's been enough of the heavy elements to form the rocky materials in the, solar, in, in the universe. So the star formation process that occurs now, um, or occurred four and a half billion years ago, was really key. Um, to, to the formation of the planets in general and the terrestrial planets in particular. Um, as a star formed, matter accumulated, you have the solar nebula, uh, things start sorting themselves out, uh, you have a lot of dust and gradually small particles, small particles become larger particles, they impact and interact with each, with each other and gradually sort, them, sort themselves out, out to planetary bodies. But the solar nebula itself, uh, and there are several theories that are uh, very active research, um, uh, the character of the solar nebula and where you have very volatile material and more rocky material is key in understanding the character and origin of the terrestrial planets. Um, so what we have here is the, the, the uh, material begin to accumulate uh, into small bodies. The small bodies themselves interact, uh, uh, accrete into larger uh, planetesimals. And this takes a few uh, million years to sort itself out. Uh, and, and what you end up with as a result is a set of uh, larger planets that uh, gradually uh, form from these smaller bodies. Um, and this obviously is a very stochastic process. Um, people who work on this have to do model after model after model and then try to discern, well, which parts of the model seem to work or at least form the solar system that we know. We have to have at least one that turns out the way we, we know it. Well, let's, let's look at, at the structure in more detail. Um, uh, where we are now, we have uh, uh, a outer uh, 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 system of uh, materials that we're calling the Oort cloud, which are, are large number of uh, primitive cometary uh, materials that form the cluster of our solar system. Uh, within that, uh, closer to home, we have uh, the current Kuiper belt. These are the outermost uh, parts of the uh, body. And these we have seen individual bodies for, and I'll, I'll return to that. Then within that, of course, we have the individual planets that we know and love. Uh, let's look at this a little closer. And for the next couple of slides, they're all derived from the uh, um, Minor Planet Center. Um, this is one of their figures that, that shows, again, the distribution of uh, known orbits of Kuiper Belt objects. The little white ones are those that are uh, uh, what's called Plutinos that, that, that are in resonance with Neptune, uh, and Pluto is one of those. Um, and then we have the, the uh, outer ice planets and Jupiter. So this is sort of the scaled structure uh, 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 as we know it. Uh, then uh, within the orbit of Saturn, we have, of course, the orbit of Jupiter. 
Um, and from Jupiter on in, we have uh, all the thousands and thousands and thousands of small bodies. Uh, again, these are all ones that have well-known orbits, and there's a lot of them. Um, and then, of course, uh, as we go past the, the main belt of asteroids, then we get to the inner planets. Uh, and this is where we are. This is what I'm going to be talking about. So we've got a major scale difference, but they're all important, and they all set the stage for what we're talking about with the inner planets. Okay, uh, here's the, the planets uh, themselves all lined up. Of course, the distances are not correct, but the scale is right. And here are inner, inner planetary bodies of the inner solar system. Uh, and for scale, here we have Ceres and Vesta, which, which Vesta we're going to uh, be, in, be having a rendezvous with this summer. Um, and Vesta is probably one of these early uh, protoplanets that have differentiated. So it's going to be a really fun story uh, relative to what we've uh, just been talking about in terms of the origin of the terrestrial planets. Okay, that sort of gives you where are we, um, how did we get there, let's continue on. Well, first of all, what is a terrestrial planet? Um, uh, terrestrial means, of course, Earth-like, okay, I think everyone knows that. Um, uh, if you look up Wikipedia, a terrestrial planet is a rocky planet, and that's a key word, uh, that is primarily composed of silicate rocks and metal. I don't know why they have an or, because we don't have any metal planets, but that's Wikipedia. Okay, what you're probably also familiar with is the IAU definition that created such an uh, avid discussion uh, defining what a planet is. And they basically have a couple of criteria that was uh, more or less agreed upon. Um, it has to orbit the sun uh, or star, depending on which system you're talking about. Uh, has sufficient mass for self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces, and this is the one that is, is key for character of a planet, uh, and has cleared the neighborhood around it. In other words, it's accreted stuff. Uh, it's, 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 it has its own place in the solar system. So here's definitions of planets, definitions of terrestrial planets. Um, let's look a little bit about some of the physical properties, because this really uh, brings it close to home. Here's the terrestrial bodies as we know them and the outer solar system in terms of density. Uh, and it's a very clear distinction that the outer solar system, uh, the icy planets and the gas pl planets uh, in terms of density are clearly distinguished from the inner terrestrial planets. Uh, you may note also that the asteroids really bridge the gap here. There's some that have similar densities to the terrestrial bodies and some that have densities uh, uh, closer to the outer solar system. So clearly that part of the solar, solar system is key for understanding how the solar system uh, or sorted itself out. And here's a, a suite of models that different people have worked on. Uh, this is the one I showed earlier. Um, all of these basically have the same concept, namely that close to the sun you're accreting rocky bodies and further from the sun is where you had the rocky ice bodies form, and that, that's consistent with everything we know. But we also know from uh, examples from stardust and from some of the meteorites that there is some mixing. It's not absolute. There's some mixing of, of components between this. But nevertheless, we end up with this very principal density difference between the terrestrial bodies and the outer solar system. Okay, so we've, we've, we know where we are, what, 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 what we are, let's move further. Uh, so this is the summary slide, what is a terrestrial planet? In short, it has to be big enough to have significant gravity. You can stand on a terrestrial planet. Uh, and it's made of rocks. Okay. Okay, well, why do we care? Well, I think we, we could spend hours and hours discussing this, especially if we, we had a more leisurely environment. But, but why do we care? It's because we live on a terrestrial planet. All the things that I just walked through are key, or we wouldn't be here. Um, oh, we live on this planet. It's, it's a key part of the terrestrial planets. We want to understand what makes the terrestrial planets work from the very early beginnings through the uh, origin and creation and formation of the solar system to our home. That's why. And we can go on and on about that. that in, in a nutshell, it's it. Okay. 
Um, here's a, a, a plot of ages of materials that uh, my colleagues um, in Italy uh, prepared, uh, different measurement uh, uh, of the ages of materials. It's a very busy plot, but has a lot of information. And what I've highlighted here are the key parts relevant to the, some of the points I'm making. Namely, the earliest material in the solar system formed at 4.5678, just remember, 4.5678, that's the time that the earliest material in the solar system formed by a variety of techniques. That's the CAI benchmark of when did stuff start happening in our solar system. Um, and then just a few million years later, we had some melting occur. Melting and, and differentiation. Um, you know, some of the, the uh, meteorites that probably came from Vesta. So this time scale is also very important. It says that not long after the very first solid material happened in the solar system were there major processes that melted them and we got these planetary embroils that had differentiated material within it. So that's a key aspect that led to the character and formation of the terrestrial planets. Here's a summary of the heat sources. The ones that are most involved in the early uh, is, of course, the cre accretional heating that I mentioned. Uh, the belief currently is that the principal cause of the major melting is the short-lived radiogenic heating that's coupled to star formation and supernovas, et cetera. This happened very rapidly and is probably the reason why we had melting early on. And of course, core formation. And all these things happen very quickly in the early stages of solar system formation. Then, of course, later on we have tidal heating, we have various solar inputs, and the radiogenic heating of the more long-lived uh, 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 elements that uh, form remelting of the mantle and, and creating basalts, etc. But the earliest part is, is, is shown there. Um, so, um, what I've been sort of leading up to, that it certainly appears that some of these embryos that, that happened very early in the solar system, the first few million years, were themselves already differentiated. Um, and most models that uh, involve them already start with, with differentiated bodies. And that's an important aspect of character of the planetary bodies themselves, the, the silicate bodies themselves. Okay, th this is a, a lovely story that Robin Knapp uh, has been, been uh, 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 modeling for, and, and improving upon for decades. And it basically shows uh, quite vividly the character of uh, some of the last stages uh, in our solar system. This is particularly the uh, uh, Earth-Moon forming impact where a large body collided with the proto-Earth. But it happened in this first um, couple of million years of solar system. Uh, formation. Uh, the timing of this event, uh, we, we've just talked about the timing here. This event, the Earth-Moon uh, formation, was only th about 30 million years later. This is all very rapid in the early part of the solar system. Very uh, violent event, uh, uh, but, but the result of this event, of course, um, uh, was the uh, Earth-Moon system as we know it to, that evolved to what we know today. Okay, now I'm going to get into some of the more details. And, and, and clearly, I, the examples I give are examples. They're ones that I, I particularly like. But I apologize for those of you who, I didn't include your own favorite examples. There's, there's more than I could possibly uh, highlight here. Okay, let's look more closely at the terrestrial bodies themselves in comparison. We've, we've already looked at the overview character. This is the size, uh, Venus and the Earth. This is a cutaway for their interior, emphasizing the three components of a terrestrial planet, the crust, the mantle, uh, and the core, and the comparison of these terrestrial bodies in these three components. They're different. They all have rocky materials, they all have a core, they all have a crust, but how they formed and how they evolved are different because of the stochastic processes involved in their formation as well. 
Um, here's uh, another chart of the same sort of thing, except now they're, they're little pie charts to show you uh, size. This particular uh, chart uh, also tries to distinguish the character of the core, whether it's a solid core or a molten core. Of course, Mercury and the Earth we know has magnet have magnetic fields, and consequently we've got dynamos that uh, are presumed to exist in, in both of these. We don't know about Venus, but because of the close relationship between Venus and the Earth, we presume it must, but why we haven't detected a magnetic field is interesting. But for Mars and the Moon, uh, they do have cores, but they probably are not um, uh, active. Uh, so the character and origin of the cores for these smaller bodies is a very important aspect or milestone in understanding the terrestrial planets. Oh, I think I, well, okay. So what we're going to look at here is, is uh, this is some figures that Jim Head put together a couple of years ago. Actually, this one was early. Uh, 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 I think I missed one. Let me go back. Yeah, okay. Um, th this figure uh, was before Magellan and before many of the missions to Mars that uh, have, have uh, been so productive recently. It's been revised um, in that with Venus, we now know we have none of the early record on Venus. We only have the, the most recent uh, record uh, of the last five, six hundred million years. Uh, we know Mars volcanism has extended to relatively recently, but we don't know the magnitude. In fact, some of the more recent uh, missions, um, things that we thought were smooth and obviously basaltic are probably smooth because of sedimentary processes. So there's, there's a whole level of additional complexities that we're still uh, trying to understand for Mars. Um, but if we want to understand the first billion years, we can't look at these planets. We really have to look at uh, some of the planets that have retained the uh, character of what occurred during the first billion years and consequently the, the emphasis in my talk on, on the moon. Why the moon? Well, the simple answer, it's pure geology pure geology. And well, why is it pure? And I've listed several examples here. The moon is a terrestrial body with a crust, mantle, and core. Okay, we've been through that. The moon is a one-plate planet. What that means, it doesn't have any of the cyclical uh, te plate tectonics that have resurfaced uh, other planets, in particular the Earth and Venus, most, most uh, obviously. Uh, the moon uh, is rel relatively dry, and I say relatively. There's a few sessions on Thursday morning and I think uh, 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 the afternoon that really focus on how much water is in the mantle of the moon. Um, but it's, it is relatively dry, and consequently the absence of aqueous weathering and redistrib redistribution of materials um, uh, is, a, is a strong point for the moon. It, it comes back to pure geology. And similarly, the moon has no appreciable atmosphere, so we don't have any aeolian weathering or, or redistribution. Uh, in my view, one of the key elements is that the moon is at 1 AU. In other words, it's the same location as the Earth. So we have the same impact record, um, but it's preserved on the surface of the moon. So in short, the moon retains the first billion years of terrestrial planet evolution. Okay, here's a word chart, and I'm not going to go through all these, um, but, but there are a number of key questions about the character and uh, evolution of terrestrial planets, cores, mantles, and, and the crust that the moon uh, is ideally suited uh, to address. Uh, what is the primary crust? How did it evolve? Uh, what's the nature of the mantle? What's the relationship of the mantle to the crust? Uh, nature of the impact record, and there are several aspects of that. And I'm going to give examples of these uh, over the next uh, uh, several minutes. Oops, I've got a heavy hand. Okay, okay. Coming, we, we, we've been through this: the timing, the the formation of materials melting, and the the timing of the giant uh, uh, Earth-Moon impact. Well. Um, after the formation of the Earth-Moon system and the accretion of the Moon, uh, we know that, or we've developed the concept of a magma ocean. 
uh, where we have a, an extensive zone of melt. And this is now a model that's been used virtually for all the terrestrial planets. And in the case of the moon, as this magma ocean differentiated, the, the sequence is, is uh, a mafic mantle and a very uh, plagioclase rich crust. This is probably different for each of the planets, but the concept of a magma ocean and, and a differentiated crust is, is quite comparable. Uh, and and uh, somewhere probably between these two is where we, we had the core formation as well. Well, um, when did this crust form? So this gets back to what's the timing? We've walked through the formation of the Earth-Moon system. When did the crust form? Well, there's a lo lovely um, example uh, done by Mark Norman and several of his colleagues who deal with, with the details of, of age dating. Um, and these pharaoh and anorthosites are difficult to date because they're mostly anorthosite. They, you know, uh, so what, he, what this group of people did was find a key group of these and, and combine their mafic minerals and you get a beautiful isochron. The plagioclases are a little bit more messy, but that's to be expected. But you get a very well-defined isochron for some of the earliest uh, anorthositic crust. And that's only about 80 million years after the formation of the Earth-Moon system. So it's, again, the crust formed very fast. Um, uh, there's no question about this. This is a very good set of data now. Um, not only that, um, and let me go back. Um, oops. Um, this, this is from lunar samples, okay, and we know lunar samples are limited. How well do we, lunar samples really represent the moon itself? Well, here's where some of the recent data come into play. Um, and I, I am showing a few spectra, for those of you who like spectra. Here's some spectra of anorthosites. Uh, and these are spectra of a, uh, the, uh, the innermost rim, ring of Oriental, which shows that the entire ring, this entire mountain belt, is an orthocyte with no mafic minerals detected. Um, so, so it really confirms the presence of this massive anorthosite that's predicted from the magma ocean theory. Not only that, this beautiful example from the Kagea mission uh, published in 2009 shows that these anorthosites are widespread. Um, uh, so, so this combination really confirms that this concept of, of extensive differentiation is not just a few fragments in our samples. It's global and it's, and it's uh, uh, across the moon uh, as a whole. Um, okay, well, here, here's, uh, for those chemists of you, here's two model or two depictions of the, the mineralogy of uh, uh, the results of the magma ocean, and you know there's a problem here because of the massive character of the, the magma ocean. The magnesium-rich components um, are formed first, and, and as the, the uh, uh, differentiation sequence continues, you get a very you get, you get a problem of density. Namely, you have the more dense things on the top and the less dense things on the bottom. And that's not good. So several groups, uh, and I know several of you are in the audience here, have worked on, well, wh how do you, how did, did the moon rearrange itself? And it probably did. Um, we don't know exactly how, and that's why the best brains in the country are working on it. But we've got, in addition to this primary differentiation sequence, it has to have reorganized itself some. And the moon holds the key for understanding, or at least having a, uh, an option to look for examples of, of how this, this actually occurred. Um, in addition to the, the uh, plagioclase-rich crust, which is shown uh, in this part of a, a plagioclase content versus Mayfi uh, mineral content, the, the plagioclase-rich crust falls neatly into a very well-organized uh, sequence. But from the lunar samples, we also find there's another sequence of, uh, of mineralogy called the magnesium suite. It's more magnesium rich uh, and has a much wider range of anorthite content, quite different from this primary crust. So how did these materials form? Uh, uh, the secondary materials probably in the lower crust linked to the mantle. Uh, there's several hypotheses associated with this. Um, this is one cartoon that um, uh, Paul Spudis um, designed several years ago. Here's 
a mantle. Here's the anorthositic crust that we were talking about and, and some debris on top of it. And what's hypothesized is that, that, that somewhere in the sequence of events, you get some mafic intrusions that account for this additional diversity that are seen in the lunar sample. This is our cartoon, it's hypothesized, but what we now want to look at is do we have evidence in any of the remote data that will help us understand the relationship between this now well-documented anorthosidic crust and these other components that have to have been part of the lunar crust. Um, well, there are several ways we can address the, the character of the lower crust and mantle. And I've listed four here, and I'm only going to talk about two um, very briefly. Uh, uh, one way you can uh, evaluate the lower crust and mantle is to model the crustal thickness from gravity and topography. Uh, this was do done nicely by um, uh, our Japanese colleagues in 2009, and this is a crustal thickness model. Uh, using topography and gravity uh, from the most recent measurements. Um, uh, I want to highlight a, a basin called Muscoviense here, which under these uh, measurements and models uh, have the thinnest crust on the moon, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, coming up soon with GRAIL and uh, perhaps the International Lunar Network, we'll be able to evaluate higher resolution through gravity and seismic profiling to understand the character and distribution of the crust and mantle. Well, let's, can we look for exposures uh, of these materials? Well, where we'd look is at major basins, basins that have dug deepest into the crust and possibly exposed material uh, from the deepest layers within the crust. And we believe we're finding fragments of that now in the remote data. And I have two examples here. Well, actually, they're both for Muscoviense, that basin that I pointed to, which uh, from the gravity and topography uh, have the thinnest crust that's currently measured. Uh, here's the topography. Uh, our experiment, m -cube, had a data strip right along the innermost ring. Now remember, the innermost ring is what in Oriental exposed the anorthosite. So it dug deep and exposed beautifully deep-seated layers. Well, we've got a different basin now, and it it's, has a thinner crust in the, the area. What do we see? Well, here's an image of this strip. Uh, showing the topography. It's a very feldspathic basin. We see a lot of the feldspathic material. But we see very specific concentrations of olivine, orthopyroxene, and a spinel-rich lithology. And it's not just spinel-rich. It's a magnesium aluminum spinel with maybe 5% iron uh, and no other mafic minerals very distinctive lithology that we hadn't seen before and it's quite clear at one location and another location and we've since then detected it at a uh, additional location on the moon. So we've got some lithologies that are linked to these deep-seated materials that we suspect are part of the secondary uh, components of the lunar crust. Um, another related example, again for Muscoviense, just came out in, in Nature, uh, where the regions of olivine-rich material have been identified. Uh, this area here is the same one here, and they've identified several other areas associated with this, and globally. So there, there's clues now that we can start piecing together using some of these major uh, uh, basins and craters as probes to the interior to understand and document the kind of issues I've been outlining. Um, and last, and I'll come back to this later, we can assess components of the impact melt from largest basins if we get a sample from them. And I'll come back to the Moonrise mission uh, in a moment. Okay, but let's return to the impact record. Um, the, the, the accretion part of the, you know, the earliest part that we've, we've been talking about had a very steep um, um, decline of impactors in the earliest part of, of uh, solar system evolution, and we've touched about that. But what happened with the rest of the time? Uh, was it a smoothly declining uh, 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 sequence of material being swept up and clean? Or, as is suggested from lunar samples, was there a pulse of major events um, around four billion years ago? 
Well, um, just recently in science, a really fascinating paper came out that says that somewhere between the um, formation of the moon and the beginning developments of the crust, the formation of the core, and before the crust was completed, the uh, character of the highly ceridophile elements strongly suggest that you had to have a late stage accretion um, between those two time frames, between when the, the moon was formed, the core was formed, and the last closure of the crust. Not only for the moon, but for Mars and the Earth. They all have chondritic kinds of, of signatures uh, of these highly ceridophile elements. And what, what, what Botke and his associates did was to look at populations that could do this. And they, they have a very nice, intriguing story that uh, lets all this come together, but requires uh, the late accretion of uh, material before closure of the uh, crustal evolution. So it's, in terms of populations, it's a very important data point. Okay, well, let's come back to, to um, the existence or not of the late heavy bombardment. Uh, here's a map of, I think, 40 of the most prominent uh, basins on the moon. Um, I understand from Fred Fye, there's probably another 40 that, that are not on this map. But um, the, the question that people have is that from the samples, it appears that that, that for the basins that we know and for the me impact melt samples we have, they appeared to form in a very specific time range. It wasn't a gradual decrease. So it's been called the late heavy bombardment that perhaps formed all these basins uh, or the cataclysm. Um, and there's two hypotheses. Uh, one is that, in fact, these basins are the last dregs of the uh, uh, solar system material. Uh, dynamicists don't like that at all. It's hard to keep things around uh, for 500 million years. It's going to clean itself out. Um, so there's a second hypothesis that I'm going to show you in a moment that says it's uh, a product of the late heavy bombardment. And you've probably seen this lovely uh, diagram, which is called the Nice uh, model. Uh, it starts with uh, orbits of the outer planets and a, a series of uh, materials uh, exterior to them. And what's shown here is millions of years since solar system formation. And these are interacting with each other gravitationally. Um, and, and it takes a while for the large planets and these bodies to interact and sort of sort out. You can see the orbits moving around a little bit as time goes on. Then you slow it down and wham! Things, what happens in this particular model is Jupiter and Saturn uh, uh, reach a resonance. And when they reach that resonance, that has a domino effect on virtually everything else. And it sends all these bodies throughout the solar system. Uh, it's a model, uh, and it's one of models. Uh, it, it happens in the first couple of hundred million years, and it takes a while for the solar system to sort of, for this to kick in. So nothing happens for several hundred million years, and then things happen. Uh, so this is the, the Nice hypothesis by uh, a group of uh, uh, investigators that published in 2006, and it's been refined several times uh, since then. Um, so the hypothesis then is that, that, that there is a way we can get a spike in, in impactors um, several hundred million years after the formation of the solar system. This spike, with all the basins that it happened on the moon, and certainly what happened on the Earth, which is typically 20 th times as many, uh, completely changed the character and environment. Um, it, the Moonrise mission that I alluded to earlier is a, a mission that's in the step two right now to obtain a sample from the center of the basin in order to uh, date the uh, the character of this basin. This basin, the South Pole Aiken Basin, is the oldest and the largest documented basin on the moon. There's some sessions uh, Thursday and Friday that deal specifically with it, and I uh, recommend it. And the Nice model 
is, is an excellent model that really predicts the origin of the, the uh, impactors. Uh, it's a testable hypothesis um, that, that will resolve whether this occurred or not or whether it was a, a, a continuous stream. This is very important for understanding the terrestrial planets and, and rocky planets in any solar system, whether you have this kind of event happening uh, on the rocky bodies. Before I leave this slide, I have to give a lesson for those of you who don't know the moon well. South Pole, Aiken Basin. Here is the South Pole, right here. Here is the equator. Here is the crater Aiken. The basin is called because it goes from the South Pole to Aiken. South Pole, Aiken Basin is not, I repeat, not located at the South Pole. All the good stuff is uh, several hundred thousands or thousand kilometers away. So remember that. Okay, here, here's uh, uh, again some diagrams. I, it's tilted a little bit different, but again, here's the South Pole. Here's the topography of the basin, and, and these are at the same scale now. And what this shows is the iron distribution of iron from GRS, which shows this basin has dug up iron rich material. It really uh, is it's an excellent place to not only date the basin, but probably get some of the best samples that um, is closest to the interior of the moon that we can get. Deep seated material. Okay, so what's the flux at 1 AU? We've, we've talked about this. This is the part we know. I'll walk through a little bit of uh, additional new examples. Um, here's a lovely um, um, Lola summary of uh, the topography of the moon. Um, one of the nice things about the accumulating LOLA data, the, it has high resolution topography and it forms a uniform characterization of, uni of lunar features, which means that um, unlike previously where, where uh, geologists were dependent on what the lighting conditions were to identify craters, when you have a high resolution topography set, you can, you can identify craters independent of what the sun is doing. Uh, so this uh, has created a wonderful data set um, and shown in the next slide is all the uh, craters greater than uh, 20 kilometers. And let's see if I can flip back and forth between these. You can sort of see patterns. Uh, obviously the Mari have um, uh, fewer craters, um, but in the highland areas, and look at, look at Oriental over here, uh, the, there, there's some interesting systematics that show it's not uniform every, everywhere. Um, there's a nice paper that came out in Science about this. It basically uh, looked at the exterior of Oriental, not the interior, the exterior, and showed that uh, going from the uh, uh, Cordarian Mountains out, you have a, a lower crater population than, than about 500 uh, kilometers uh, distal. So it's clear the basin uh, has significantly reprocessed the surface in a very measurable way with, with these craters. Uh, very, very clear in this particular assessment using the LOLA data. Uh, similarly for other, other basins, they looked at Oriental, uh, 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 Imbrium and Nectaris. Um, I'm not going to go through those, but, but basically you can get relative ages and the combination of this and the shape of this is highly suggestive that in fact there were two populations, one that occurred early and one that occurred late and sometime around the Oriental period is when you transition from one to the other. Okay, I'm getting near the end here. Uh, let's, let's look at things that are more current. Uh, uh, the moon right now is a wash in the solar uh, uh, wind, uh, the plasma that sweeps through it, largely hydrogen. Um, I think you know that, and Laurie alluded to this, that, that uh, we have uh, spectroscopically identified widespread surficial OH or H2O based on the strength of a prominent feature at three microns, and you can measure the strength of this uh, spectroscopically. That's what's shown in the little blue areas up here. Um, I'm not going to talk much about this, but I do want to talk about an additional measurement that uses the strength of the water uh, or OH band for some uh, uh, 
unusual features on the moon that in fact may help give us clues to the character and origin of the magnetic field on the moon. These are these uh, enigmatic swirls that some of you are familiar with. If you look at these, th th there's just very highly unusual albedo features. It, these has been un the, they've puzzled people for decades. Uh, two of the most prominent, Ingeni and Reiner Gamma. Um, we know that most of these swirls are associated with magnetic anomalies. This is a map from uh, Lunar Prospector. Um, the correlation between the existence of these unusual albedo features and magnetic anomalies is quite strong. Uh, there's a paper uh, that's in process in JGR that's going to be discussing these and particularly discussing the m cubed results. I've got three examples here, Reiner Gamma, Gerasimovich, and Ingeni. The scale bar here is the same in each of them. They're 50 kilometers. Um, uh, a Mari area, Mari Highland, and a Highland area on the far side. So this is what they look like, and you can sort of see the swirly feature. It's harder to see in the Highland, but what's interesting is that, uh, and I'm using the Reiner Gamma as the example here, albedo, this is a map of pyroxene band strength from m cubed, so you sort of see that it's not exactly the same. But if you measure the strength of the OH band, it's, a mo it's an incredible distinction. Namely, low here means low OH relative to surroundings. So these features have low OH relative to surroundings. Now remember, this is associated with magnetic environments. If we look at the, all three, you see the same thing, namely the low OH associated with these unusual features. And in particular, the highland are really important. Look at this, this little swirl or low OH here. You barely can pick out the albedo feature here. A uh, whole bunch of swirly things here. Low, something about the magnetic association with these features have shielded, if you will, this is a hypothesis, the OH interaction, so we have lower OH where we have these features and consequently where we have magnetic features. Summary, uh, the swirls are depleted in OH relative to their surroundings. This association of magnetic anomalies, which presumably are associated with whenever the core was formed, and however the character of the magnetic anomalies were created is linked to solar wind processes. Okay, uh, I'm gonna end with Copernicus, uh, one of my favorites. This is an m cube image of Copernicus. The central peaks are shown there. Oops, heavy finger. Uh, um, you probably know from telescopic data, from Clementine data, from m cube spectra, from Cayuga data, these central peaks in Copernicus, which is a beautiful, you know, 100 kilometer crater, are very olivine rich. That, that we know, we've confirmed, it's great. Um, let's look at it in color, and this color rendition basically enhances the, the absorption band due to olivine. Uh, and if we look at the, the arrow is, I'm sorry, I'm, the, darn it, sorry. The arrow is, is where I'm going to be going with some high resolution, beautiful LROC data uh, to get a character of these beautiful blocks, the base of it, you know, there's wonderful bedrock exposures, none of these little wimpy rocks. There's beautiful uh, blocky exposures uh, at Copernicus. Um, so in closing, um, one of the, um, thrills of the last dawn team meeting we had in, in Rome, uh, we were uh, fortunate to have a, a special tour of the Vatican collection of rare books. And here's uh, the, the book of, the, you can probably read Latin better than I can, uh, uh, to be able to look at these books, to touch it, to turn the pages. Uh, to see these diagrams, there's the solar system, the Mercury, Venus, Earth and Moon, uh, uh, and a nice ring of stars around it. But here we have the Earth and Moon from the very beginning of when we started to study planets. So with that, I think I'll close. We've come full circle for the Earth-Moon system, the template for the terrestrial planets, and the Moon. Thank you. <laughs>
So if, if, if anybody has a burning question for Carly, she's happy to answer. You have to shout, maybe, or maybe there's a microphone back there. So I have one. So do you think the, um, the, the OH distribution with the anomalies is going to bear on the origin of the water itself, or do you think it's purely sort of a secondary effect to redistribution of the hydrogen? Do you think it's both bears on how the hydrogen got there as well as its distribution? That's a very good question, and one of the things that is ongoing is, is how was the OH formed? Right. And as I sort of alluded, although I didn't go into great detail, is the, the leading hypothesis associated with the solar wind. What makes these swirls nice is that those have magnetic fields which do interact with the protons. And that gives us a stronger suggestion that, in fact, the OH and the, 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 the H from the solar wind and the O from the silicates are, in fact, the key part of the process. Um, uh, I, I suspect there's going to be a lot of work on these swirls to try to not only resolve that issue, but to link back to the magnetic field in more, more, more detail. Okay, well, thank you, Carly, once again, and I have a certificate here for you from AGU thanking you for being our shoemaker lecturer. I'm sure Jean would have been very pleased and proud. Uh, so thanks so again, Carly, and thank you all for coming.